Good morning, my name is Raphael Torres and my project today will be on the modern period. Um, so the modern period, it began sometime around the early 20th century, so a little bit before World War I. Um, it saw the rise of realism in black writers such as Alice Walker, um, and it gave birth, it, it was the birth and the rise of psychoanalysis uh, by Fr Sigmund Freud. Um, so, some characteristics of the modern period, uh, a focus on poor marginalized characters in the city, a loss of faith in the ideal, the natural environment offered an antidote to the artifices and injustices of human societies, um, use of colloquial speech and lively dialogue, descriptions of plausible individuals and in recognizable circumstances or realistic social situation, um, and a rejection of symbols and allegories, sentimentally and sentimentally. Wait, we can cut this. All right. yeah. A rejection of symbols and allegories, sentimentality, and sensation, sensationalism. <laughs> Otherworldly ideals and timeless values in favor of the literal, the specific, and the observable. The social world as it appeared in the here and the now. Um, so we see here in three studies for figures at the base of a crucifixion by Francis Bacon. Um, the themes are, as they explored the human psyche, psychologists and anthropologists realized that savage impulses were not limited to primitive peoples. Eventually, the simple dichotomy of primitive and civilized lost its validity. Um, we kind of see that with just like the mangled, grotesque bodies. Um, visual art and literature cannot be deliberately powerfully hideous like i said before um just like the almost human uh but completely not human at the same time it's just really like eerie and uh there's a focus on an, an emphasis on internal psychological reality as well as the shaping force of external circumstances so um we see here that that this person is just like warped and twisted um so it, I, I think it's kind of representative of something that lies deep within us humans. Um, the art can be defined as ugly or gross, but it is also a reflection of the World War I period. Um, so here in Jason Pollock's Autumn Rhythm, um, we, we can see realism, uh, one of the most powerfully influential global artistic movements, in which many artists felt a new urgency to tell the unvarnished truth about the world, to observe it unsentimentally, and to convey it as objectively as possible. Um, the, the world's messy, you know? So this is what the artist tries to convey. Um, we see a rejection of symbols and allegories, sentimentality and sensationalism, otherworldly ideals, and timeless values in favor of the literal, the specific, and the observable, the social world as it appeared in the here and the now. Um, around this time, uh, World War One was going on, so like in this picture, there's just so much stuff going on, and there always is a lot of stuff going on in the world because that's just how the world works. Um, we see a use of stream of consciousness representation, the flowing, unpunctuated sentences that merge memory, present awareness, and fall out of associative logic. Um, I feel like this this art piece it kind of a uh, it's kind of the perfect image of a stream of thought consciousness. Uh, the mind is like a stream of incoherent thoughts or just like splashes of paint on the canvas. Um, so, Alice Walker. Alice Walker was born in 1944 in Eatonton, Georgia, to sharecroppers. Um, so after being valedictorian at the first black high school, Walker went on to start a career as a famous writer. Um, her writings have won her many awards, such as the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. She's also um, made a movie, uh, The Color Purple. It's one of her novels that she wrote. Um, here's some pictures of her right here. Um, so, uh, a little summary of everyday use. Um, in everyday use, we see the main character, Mama, get visited by her daughter. Um, named D, but yeah, we'll, we'll get to that, and, and a man. So her daughter, who has abandoned her name, D, now asks her mom to make 
well, to ask your mom for the quilt made by her grandmother. But uh, mom, after thinking about her situation, finds it better for her other daughter uh, to get the quilt instead. So um, some characteristics I found in this piece, there's um, the ability to mix and fuse traditions from different continents due to the advent of steamship and telegraph. Uh, we see here when Jero reaches D, she um, she just loves like Africa and African culture because she feels like those are her roots, so she wants to be connected to them. Uh, we see a rejection of symbolism and allegories, sentimentality and sensationalism, otherworldly ideals and timeless values in favor of the literal, the specific and the observable. The social world does like a period in the here and the now. Um, and a focus on poor and marginalized characters in the city. Um, so, my scene summary, uh, when Jero asks her mother for the blankets, but mom explains why there's a problem with her taking them. Um, but Maggie, when Jero's sister, decides to let her have them. Um, that's when Mama basically comes in, puts her foot down, takes the blankets from Linjero, and gives them to her daughter Maggie, um, and embraces her. The, this is significant because it's Mama rejecting Linjero's um, symbolic use of, so like a rejection of symbolism of the quilts over Maggie's everyday use. Um, the best way to appreciate your culture or past is to use the object, not to hang it up. And my things. I looked at her hard. She had filled her bottom lip with checkerberry snuff, and it gave her face a kind of dopey, hangdog look. It was Grandma D and Big D who taught her how to quilt herself. She stood there with her scarred hands hidden in the folds of her skirt, she looked at her sister with something like fear, but she wasn't mad at her. This was Maggie's portion. This was the way she knew God to work. When I looked at her like that, something hit me in the top of my head and ran down to the soles of my feet. Just like when I'm in church and the spirit of God touches me and I get happy and shout. I did something I'd never done before, hugged Maggie to me, then dragged her on into the room, snatched the quilts out of Miss Wongaro's hand and dumped them into Maggie's lap. Maggie just sat there on my bed with her open mouth.